Global events tend to be shaped by the great powers, those countries with vast territories, enormous populations and proportionate economic and military heft. At the other end of the scale, the world's smaller countries have to be more agile and inventive. If your entire nation contains fewer people than a single Shanghai suburb, you cannot reasonably expect the world stage to shake when you stamp your foot. Nevertheless, small states not only survive, but prosper. The list of top 10 countries in terms of GDP per capita includes Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Ireland, Singapore, Monaco, Qatar, Switzerland, Bermuda, the United Arab Emirates and San Marino. The combined populations of the radiantly content countries which fill the top 10 of the World Happiness Report is fewer people than live in perpetually rancorous France or the chronically grumpy United Kingdom. What are the advantages to being a small state? How can small states make their voice heard? And what is it like to lead one? This is the Foreign Desk. Small states were around for centuries. They were sort of working for bigger ones. The bigger ones were controlling them. And the number of small states was growing and they're falling down. They were appearing, they were disappearing. But it's 21st century and things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. When we gained independence, we were very conscious that we had to be on our own. And that, I think, has shaped our outlook for the longer term. We do need to be helpful. We have to be honest brokers. And we do, I think, want to play that role very reliably. Being a small state, things are just working much faster than some of the places where there is way more population. But I think it's also still more about the mindset itself as well. If you have been struggling and have been controlled by another state for so many years, you want to bring a better life and build a better life for your citizens. You're listening to The Foreign Desk. I'm Andrew Muller, and I'm joined first of all by the former head of One Small State, President Armin Sarkissian of Armenia, who held the office between 2018 and 2022. Prior to that, he served as Prime Minister and Ambassador to the United Kingdom, among other diplomatic postings. He is the author of The Small States Club, How Small Smart States Can Save the World. Mr. President, your book is, of course, a discussion of and in some respects a celebration of small states and the opportunities and the power they have. You got to see this from the inside. You were ambassador here in the UK to NATO and the EU. You were prime minister. You were president. Did it occur to you often along that journey that you had the ability to do things and act in a way that perhaps a leader of a huge power couldn't? Did you feel like you had a certain freedom? I think I I could say at the beginning of my diplomatic career, I was a scientist when the Soviet Union broke down and I was, in fact, in London working as a visiting professor, also at the School of Mathematical Sciences here in London University. I was enjoying working here. Then Armenia became independent. I had some small contribution in helping guys to make Armenia independent, but when Armenia became independent and the first president of the republic very early days, offered me to help to establish an embassy here. I took that as an honor. So Mm. I got a piece of paper called saying that I'm in charge of affairs of Armenia, I'm the charge d'affaires. And with that paper, I went to a foreign office and got a lot of understanding and kindness and support, to be Mm -hmm. honest. I was physicist. I could teach anybody at the foreign office mathematics and physics. I knew nothing about diplomacy, so I started learning from then. That endeavor was successful. In two months, we had the embassy. Then the president asked me to open another one in Paris, then in Brussels, then all over Europe. So eventually I became not only ambassador to many countries, but also in charge of European affairs. There is a big difference between being a first ambassador of small republic, newly independent, emotionally driven country and a nation or a diplomat of an established state, because diplomat of an established state. But in my case, it was all creative work, because there was no really foreign ministry. I was working directly with president, and there was a lot of creative work and enjoyment. So, because being a scientist, I really liked that part of that. Of course, with the years, Armenia is becoming 
a country as a state. And of course, being a diplomat becomes a little bit boring for someone like me because <laughs> it becomes a civil servant's work. But the first years were absolute enjoyment because you were serving a great idea of making your country independent again after losing your independence as a state 100 years ago, or losing your last kingdom 700 years ago. But even once a, a smaller country becomes established, do you feel like, again, that they can be a bit more agile, a bit more inventive? I think you write at one point in the book that they are, as you put it, uniquely equipped to be the vanguards of change and models for others. What can a small state do now that a bigger one can't, even once it's established? I like the word now in your in your question, because... Clearly, I think small states were around for centuries. You go back a couple of hundred years, there was a lot of small Europe states. Europe used to be a patchwork of hundreds yeah, yeah, of yeah. them. Yeah, and then there were, of course, there were not even allies. They were sort of working for bigger ones. The bigger ones were controlling them, were they using mm. them. And the number of small states was growing and they're falling down. They were appearing, they were disappearing. But it's 21st century, things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. And of course, that means also the old laws and rules that we had, we had created, we had nurtured in the classical world that we lived even 30 years ago, including our very important values. Let's take the value of democracy. How do I exercise democracy? Well, 30 years ago, 40 even today, we go to the ballot once in four or five years, put our opinion. And then if we are lucky, we get the, the member of the parliament from our village coming and seeing us once a year or twice. That's it. But in reality, today people vote from five to ten times a day through Facebook. I mean, democracy is changing, our principles, ideology is changing, everything is changing. It's a different story that we don't understand that. And what is also changing, that the changed environment has created a, a unique environment for small, small, but smart states, not for every small one, but the ones who are smart. This is also something you raise in the book, that you think between the two concepts of hard power and soft power, there's something you call smart power. Yes, of course. I think the hard power and smart, hard and the soft power was the ideas were created by a very good friend of mine, Professor Joseph mm -hmm. Nye from Kennedy School. He, in reality, created these two ideas uh, or emphasized these two ideas connected with United States. I mean, he was analyzing United States hard power, which is military power and economic power, and the soft power, which is values of United States and the freedom and culture and so on. But there is another power, that I do think, especially in the new world, which is smart power. How effectively you are using your hard power that exists, even small countries have their hard power. And among hard power, I would also mention hard, hard, hard potential power. If you have, for example, oil, gas, mm. uh, economic potential of growth, that's your hard power. And how effective you are using your software, your culture, your, your people and, and, and their activity to smartly create something which will uh, name your, your state, your country, a smart state. And if you look at, and of course, the smartness always has to be focusing into the future, not into the past. So that's why if you look, for example, if you take, um, if you take statistics from Bloomberg, World Economic Forum, World Bank, anybody about the sort of smart states, let's say, in Europe or in the world, which are focusing in the future, like if you take the index of e-government, I mean, the, if you take the first 10 states, the best ones in mm -hmm. the world, they are all small. And starts with a very small state, which is hmm? Estonia. Mm -hmm. It's not France. It's not Germany. It's not the United States. It's Estonia. If you take the index of innovation, again, probably among the, the worldwide top 10 will have only two countries, America and the UK. All their remaining eight will be uh, small, smart states. Uh, even if you take how effective the governments work, again, the top 10 will be countries like Switzerland or... or but yeah. do you, you think that success is a product of the smallness, the idea that it is maybe a relatively intimate community where people feel like they know each other and therefore can trust each other? And not only that, not only that, because of, of the scale of that. I think smallness gives gives you an advantage. Mm -hmm. Smallness, of course, it's it's... It's 
somehow, or I can say I have been a prime minister and president of a small country compared with the problems of a country like Russia <laughs> or United States. It's very complex. It's complicated. The number of people is is having huge impact on, on it. Of course, the smallness. The smallness makes you operating in, in an environment where you can make sharp decisions and it doesn't it doesn't mean that if you are small you are not complex enough or you cannot be complicated enough i've seen in my life <laughs> states that have 25000 citizens and their parliament was as corrupt as anything <laughs> in the world so i think smallness doesn't guarantee you but obviously and don't forget that in this new quantum world Except the smart small states that are dominant, they are very important. They are also sort of a virtual states that have huge impact, but that they have a different structure. These are the big multinationals. Google is a small state. <laughs> Apple is a small state. Do you like it or not? And it's a question who has more influence Facebook on U.S. government or the other way around. And they act worldwide as, as states. And their Im impact on worldwide is very, very huge. It's a super soft power. Basically, it's a smart soft power in the hands of, of a company that has, let's say, 300,000 employees but has global impact. So the s rising states, like states like Israel, like the same Estonia, like Denmark, Ireland, Switzerland, where Singapore is a wonderful example, where the smartness can produce, produce huge uh, new technological advances. And who said that Steve Jobs or Albert Einstein should be born in big states? They can hmm. be born in small ones. In the future, I think the, the power of technology, the power of science is going to be dominant. And here is where small states will be very, very important. And that's why I'm lobbying to create an organization, S20. S20, now where are the small states that are becoming more increasingly more important? Okay, Where are they represented? At the UN Security Council? Not so much. Uh -huh. uh, at the G20? Uh, G7? Definitely not. Okay. Where is the organization? It doesn't exist. So I am lobbying already for several years to create an organization that will be the club of the small and smart states. Who are small, who are run? I think it's it's not a mathematical definition of whether we can agree together even who are small. Mm. Obviously, the same Emirates are small. Qatar is small. Singapore is small. Israel is small. Lithuania is small. Luxembourg is small. Ireland is small. Okay. And all of these countries are very successful states. And it's not the time that you can say that small states are controlled and they are just just a, a sort of a entourage of the, of, of, of the big states. It's not. I just have one final question on small states related to exactly that. And there is a line in your book where you say, as an Armenian, I am always alert to the hazards of overdependence on the goodwill of others. Uh, but nevertheless, we talked a bit about military power, which is where most small states can't really compete. If the world becomes increasingly, I, I guess, dominated by big powers like the United States, India, China, is it possible for a small state to survive long term without a patron of that sort? Does it need to be allied to one of the superpowers? The answer is yes. And the examples are several of them. Mm. And the, the, the sort of a brightest example today is, is Israel. Okay, everybody, the, the, a lot of people will say that, that Israel has a patron, which is the United States. But does the United States run Israel? The answer is no. Mm. Okay, so that's an example. Secondly, when we're speaking about military power, economic power. First of all, economically, a small state can be as, first of all, if you look at the GDPs per, per capita, a lot of the small, smart states far ahead than big states. So people live much better mm. in small, and small uh, smart states. Secondly, future military power will depend on science. And a small state can have so powerful military presence with artificial intelligence. So you don't need 
for example, 100 million population to have an army of a million, because that army of million can consist of drones. This uh, is an update of the mouse that roared. Yeah, mm. that's also. You can be a small state, but you can have so powerful solutions of artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, basically, artificial intelligence that is used by human intelligence, not properly, <laughs> And that human uh, intelligence is using artificial intelligence to make a military solution, to get a solution, i.e. basically creating drones and all. Because the future military power will be based on science rather than number of people. The number of people will be compensated by, by the number of robots or the drones and everything else. And a small state that has the power or a solution or a Steve Jobs being born in a small, smart state and creating something. Mr. President, thank you for joining us. That was Armin Sarkissian, the former president of Armenia. His book, The Small States Club, is available now. You're listening to The Foreign Desk. This is The Foreign Desk on Monocle Radio. Singapore is often held up as an exemplar of what a small state can accomplish at home, prosperous, orderly and secure. But how can just five and a half million people living in an area half the size of Greater London make themselves heard globally? Well, joining me now is Sim An, Senior Minister of State in the Singaporean Foreign Ministry. I guess the place to start is whether you attribute part of the reason for Singapore's success to Singapore being a small country. Do you find that an actual advantage? I think the truth is that there are very few advantages to being a small state. In fact, things can be even harder if you are a small state with no natural resources or if you're a small state in a complex part of the world, both of which apply to Singapore. But we do have something going for us, and that is our favorable geographical location. We are a natural deep water port that's located at the crossroads of important global trade routes. And in fact, our geographical location is the main reason why our forefathers came to Singapore. They were searching for livelihoods in a port city. They came from other parts of Southeast Asia. They came from India. They came from China. So the geographical location, I think, is really the core reason for Mm -hmm. our existence. But uh, statehood is not in and of itself an inevitable outcome for port cities. Uh, In Singapore's case, An independent state was eventually what we became. And thankfully, you don't need a large landmass to be an effective port, an effective hub, or indeed to be a state. But, uh, you know, to think of our small size, a natural advantage, I'm afraid, uh, you know, that's just kind of not how (laughs) it has ever occurred to us. (laughs) But in your role in particular, have have you found it difficult to project Singapore abroad and make Singapore's voice heard? Or perhaps is there an aspect of being small that gives you a certain amount of manoeuvrability that a great big lumbering nation doesn't have? Well, from time to time, we do hear our friends from larger countries, they speak or they make observations that suggest that small states are more nimble or that they are easier to manage. And so from that perspective, some people might think it is an advantage to be small. But as I've explained, as a small state, we do feel our limitations every single day, whether it is the limitations of land, whether it is the limitations on manpower, lack of resources, and so forth. So being nimble and seeking to manage ourselves well are, I think, adaptive strategies that we simply must develop uh, if we are to overcome our inherent limitations. And in the case of Singapore, it also means being very aware of our diversity. We have diversity in terms of our ethnic groups, in terms of religions, in terms of the languages that we use. And we are in a particularly diverse part of the world. So we need to get our politics right. I think that's what we mean by uh, ensuring that we can manage ourselves well. So I think first we do have to turn our diversity into a strength. And a large part of that 
is in helping Singaporeans to understand that national strategy has to be in the interest of all Singaporeans. Our policies should not serve only the interests of specific groups. But beyond domestic policy, this approach also informs what we do in terms of foreign policy. And we see it as crucial that we play an active role in strengthening multilateralism and the rule of law and to help shape the rules for the global commons, uh, be it in areas like climate change or cyberspace, because this is what makes the world safer and more prosperous, especially for small states like us. So one example of how we do this is to work with other small states. And in 1992, we founded the Forum of Small States, otherwise known as FOSS at the UN. And uh, it comprises countries with a population size of less than 10 million. The group started with 16 members in 1992, but now it has 108 members. And this has been a very useful forum for fellow small states to exchange notes on developments and also to cooperate with one another. There is, when you think, I guess, of the disadvantages that a small state might have, there's one fairly existential one. And I know you said in January, I think, at the Singapore Economic Forum, and I quote, small states are more sensitised to changes in the broader security environment. And obviously, anybody who knows Singaporean history back 80 years knows how vulnerable Singapore can be to great power shifts in the region. But Is it nevertheless important for a small state to create the impression that it does take its own defence seriously? Some do, uh, Singapore being one of them. Others don't. Costa Rica and Iceland, for example, don't really have standing militaries of their own. But why is that important to Singapore to make it look like you do take your own defence seriously, independent of any alliances? I think this goes back to our experience when we gained independence we were very conscious that we had to be on our own, that no one was going to you know, look after us specially, and that we had to be responsible for our own defense, for our own foreign policy. And I think that very difficult start to nationhood, I think has shaped our outlook for the longer term. We understand the importance of creating relevance for the rest of the world, because I, we, we don't see ourselves as, as having inherent relevance to the region or to the world. But at the same time, I think we do need to be helpful as a trade hub, as a port city. We have to be honest brokers. And we do, I think, want to play that role very reliably. And this is also the, the reason why our commitment to rules-based trade is very strong. And this is something that we, in our own modest ways, we seek to strengthen. On that subject of creating relevance, because this I know is something else you've said, that small states do depend on a rules-based order. And that's I guess, fairly self-evident because in a world in which only the strong were allowed to survive, then small states wouldn't. But as a small state, how do you advocate to the big countries for the preservation and upholding of that rules-based order? I mean, what's in it for them? Well, I think as a small state, clearly what we can do is limited because our resources are limited. But where we can help strengthen the multilateral system, where we can help make the structure stronger, I think this is where we can make an impact. I can give you a few examples. Uh, Mm -hmm. For instance, Singapore has been very closely associated with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. And in particular, our ambassador, Tommy Koh, he presided over the third UN conference on the Law of the Sea from 1981 until its conclusion in 1982. Now, this is, I think, not just an important piece of international law, which it is. It has a special significance for Singapore because maritime cooperation is so critical to a port city. And Mm -hmm. we've not stopped there. We've built on that. Uh, For instance, in March last year, our ambassador, Ms. Rina Lee, she also presided over the successful conclusion of negotiations on a new international agreement on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in the high seas, otherwise known as the BBNJ agreement. And that builds on the framework 
that was laid down in UNCLOS. But we also are active in other areas. For instance, our ambassador, Bohan Gafur, uh, he is our current permanent representative to the UN in New York. Um, he has been chairing the UN Open-Ended Working Group that is developing rules and norms for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. So this is our approach, where there is already a set of global rules or shared rules. Let's make them stronger. And in areas where rules have yet to be developed or where more foundational work um, needs to be done, I think you can count on Singapore's active participation because with this, then I think we are really walking the talk and ensuring that multilateral mechanisms are well shaped and can help to safeguard the safety and prosperity of all. But that's particularly important to small states. I mean, another big question to go out on then, how careful do you need to be about managing relationships with the big powers in your part of the world? And I guess for Singapore, is it important to be seen not to be picking a side too obviously in disputes between China and the United States, with both of which Singapore generally enjoys reasonably good relations? I'm glad you asked that, Andrew. There is, I think, a perception that Singapore's foreign policy is based on maintaining some kind of balance in terms of our relations with big powers, or some people even described it as some form of neutrality. But I think that's a bit of a misreading of mm -hmm. our approach. I think, first of all, we are very aware that our good relations, be it with the United States, with China, or with other powers, actually are based on our relevance because we do seek to be useful to countries that want to engage in Asia Pacific or in Southeast Asia that want to trade in the area, that want to invest in the area. So I think first, the foundation of economic relevance is there. And we are also very clear about our interests. We are for the political independence, the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of all states, including, and I can say especially small states because we're one of them, and for rules-based, open, multilateral trading order. That's also very important to us. And I think these are the basis on which we build our relations with powers, whether they are larger or whether they're not so large. Being able to trade, being able to do economic collaboration or more than economic collaboration with regard for the maintenance of regional peace and security is paramount to us. So if these interests are met, then we are able to have very good relations with like-minded countries and powers. And fortunately, I think for much of the period, I think post-Vietnam War, indeed these conditions were present. There has been very widespread commitment to peace. There has been widespread commitment to development. And I think in that kind of an environment, then it is possible for Singapore and indeed for other countries with similar interests as us to have and to sustain good relations with many large powers. Sim Ann, thank you very much for joining us here on the Foreign Desk on Monocle Radio. You're listening to The Foreign Desk. I'm Andrew Muller. Estonia, like its two Baltic neighbours, demonstrates that small states can flourish even in the least encouraging circumstances, i.e. right next to a vast, powerful, hostile and recurrently predatory neighbour. I'm joined from Tallinn by Annette Numa, Head of Government Relations at Accelerate Estonia and a former advisor on cyber defence for Estonia's Ministry of Defence. And that the obvious place to start is with the advances Estonia has made in the digital realm. If you measure your country against the global average, how advanced is Estonia in terms of digital infrastructure, cybersecurity and so on? Well, I could give you a very boring answer here and like kind of list a lot of different kind of rankings and say like how awesome we're doing in terms of different rankings. But I think more important thing, and since the very early days that we started already building all of our digital services, was the aim to do it. And if I could compare with some of the other states as well, I think we're very far ahead when it comes to really modernize the entire like the public sector itself or even like 
promote transparent democracy uh, that is built on trust. I think that's even more important and also just kind of foster our economic development because when we think about being a small state, it's very, very hard to have enough money and budget for everything. So that's why I think when it comes to our digital transformation, the biggest or the most important aspect there is that we actually have managed to foster our entire economic development here since we came from and we're occupied by Russia and Soviet Union. So I think that's very, very important. And just the way we think, I think it's very, very different. And of course, all of the other countries are very quickly also trying to implement their strategies as well. And they have been able to start like just also maybe five, 10 years ago and completely different technologies that we, we use. But I think it's just the entire initiatives and our ID and infrastructure and the platforms and everything are still look very efficient and we're still the forerunners in that terms as well and and one of the uniqueness that i would like to bring it out here is that we've never done that just alone but the key element there that why we might be still ahead of a lot of countries is that we are still doing most of the things together with the private sector who is always one step ahead of public sector so it's a big collaboration there I mean, you're quite right to cite the speed and scale of the transition Estonia has made. I mean, for those of us who can remember visiting it very shortly after it regained independence, the difference between that and what Estonia is like now seems much, much further than 30 years apart. What we're trying to establish, though, is the degree to which you think that was enabled by Estonia being such a small country. And to remind our listeners, Estonia is a very small country, about 1.35 5 million people. In fact, by most measures, it would be quite a small city. But has that smallness been an asset to Estonia in emerging from the Soviet Union and re-establishing itself? I think this is one of the most also common questions that in my career that I've been asked, like, were you just successful because you're a small state and you managed to do everything so fast and everything? In some extent, I do agree because it being a small state, things are just working much maybe faster, I would say, and, and also uh, that you can make decisions faster and maybe the implementation process as well is, is quicker than maybe in some of the places where there is way more uh, people, the population is way larger. But I think it's also still more about the mindset itself as well, if a country really wants to change, because what I see about like just comparing to some of the larger uh, states as well is that people are saying, okay, but things have been working in a specific way for so many years already, like why should we even bother to do this kind of bigger changes because it seems to be too much of a work to do. So I think our uniqueness there in terms of the smallness is that we do know that when you want to change something and when you want to stand out, uh, then you need to do something very fast. And maybe that's the extent that I could just bring it out here that if you're small, just things are working way faster. And especially also when we think about our background itself as well, if you have been struggling and have been controlled by another state for so many years, you want to bring a better life and build a better life for your citizens. So that's why also the kind of the mindset from uh, from the decision makers is a little different because they know that we've been struggling and, and our citizens are worth uh, really a brighter future. It's something you alluded to earlier, but how much of an advantage does that trust factor give you in a relatively small community? I mean, you're not going to know everybody, but I guess within within various professions, people will very quickly be able to find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that I really do love about living here and why I still live here in Estonia is that it's very easy to get everything done. And I've been always saying, like, any minister is just one phone call away. Our prime minister goes and buys the milk from the same supermarket that I do. I see her very often. And it's a small society that people do know each other, that you trust each other. But I think also besides just the smallness size, it's a lot about also historical kind of experiences, our past, different kind of socioeconomical factors as well that I could bring it out here, or also the culture. Also, people from the public and private sector know each other. They are friends, they work together, they have been going to the university or school together. So it's also easier to force these people so that there is no such a big gap between people that are working in one or or another sector. And also we do a lot of shifts in that way as well, so that public sector institutions are very highly trusted just because we know who work there and we know that they're like any other people. So I think that's kind of the bigger factor there. 
The final question then that is inevitably going to occur to listeners in much bigger countries is whether any of this is exportable from a country of 1.35 million people to perhaps a country of 13.5 or 135 million? Or do you basically have to be Estonia to be able to make the things that Estonia has made work work? No, I think and this is what I've been always answering as well when people are pointing on how small we are, is that when you develop something, you actually do one solution. It doesn't matter if 1 million people are using this or 140 million people are, are going to use this solution. So it's actually what is possible to also export from here or tap in other countries as well is more about like the mindset and the kind of proactive policy making. When we've been advising different governments as well, we've been always saying that you need to have a culture of innovation and the belief of innovation and technology that it will make your life a little easier, more flexible. Again, it is going to foster democracy and the trust between the citizens if everything is more transparent and you know what the government is doing with your information. Just one of the examples here as well, we have a thing called Data Tracker, where you can see which government agency has been looking for your information. And I don't think this is working in anywhere else. And I, I think what I could teach to other uh, other states, no matter how big or small they are, is just the mindset of be transparent, be proactive and really prioritize the security when you implement something. And then you will get the trust, you will get the citizens, also the private sector, who really do trust you in, in a lot of ways. So I think that's more important. And again, at the end of the day, when you develop the solution, it doesn't matter how many people are going to use this because that's just one solution itself as well. Annette, thank you. That was Annette Numa, Head of Government Relations at Accelerate Estonia and a former advisor on cyber defence for Estonia's Ministry of Defence. That is it for this episode of The Foreign Desk. We'll be back next week and look out for The Foreign Desk Explainer, available every Wednesday. The Foreign Desk was produced by Emma Searle and Christy O'Grady. Christy also produces The Foreign Desk Explainer. This has been Emma's last episode of The Foreign Desk. If you've enjoyed The Foreign Desk's conversations these last few years with presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, defence ministers, ambassadors, generals and one honest-to-goodness king, you have been enjoying Emma's supernatural guest wrangling abilities and just as importantly her ideas energy and willingness to restrain when necessary the more recherche sesquibedalian proclivities of the composer of these scripts though i didn't let her see this bit first so she couldn't cut the 50 cent words every half hour of the foreign desk represents many hours of emma's work we are not as of this broadcast entirely certain what we're going to do without her but do tune in next week to find out to contact the foreign desk team you can now email Email Chris Chermack at cc at monocle.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Monocle magazine and our free daily email bulletins by heading to our website at monocle.com. From me, Andrew Muller, thank you very much for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.